terms of your vision for how we can realize AGI, you talked about combining neural networks with other kinds of approaches like neurosymbolic systems, evolutionary learning, knowledge graphs. Another thing we're looking at, which is more on the research side, is controlling a bunch of little learning agents who are like baby AGIs, making things that really are like young, young artificial general intelligence, like AGI toddlers trying to learn about the world. In terms of AGI, to start, that's a term that I launched onto the world in 2005 with a, a book titled Artificial General Intelligence. Ben, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you on. Where are you calling in from today? I'm on Vashon Island uh, off the coast of, of Seattle. Oh, nice. Um, well, thank you very much for coming on the program. We actually hadn't met before, um, but you're a well-known entity in the artificial intelligence space. And so I've had my eye on you for a while. And we were delighted that we were able to get you on. I know that this is going to be a fascinating episode. So you're creating a benevolent, decentralized AGI at SingularityNet. Could you parse those terms for our listeners? So uh, AGI, probably most listeners know, but even a quick intro to that, just in case, could be good. But then these ideas of a decentralized AGI and a benevolent AGI I think those terms we should definitely dig into. Absolutely. And uh, I want to add none of these terms has an absolutely definite, well-defined meaning. These are things that mm -hmm. we're fleshing out as we, as we go along, which I think is a, is a feature, not a bug. I mean, just as the definition of life is something biology is fleshing out as it moves forward, which is, is mm -hmm. is just fine and doesn't stop people from doing synthetic biology or molecular biology or, or whatnot. So in terms of AGI, to start, that's a term that I launched onto the world in 2005 with a, a book titled Artificial General Intelligence, which was an edited book of papers by different researchers doing research aimed at AI that can generalize in the sense of making big leaps beyond its programming and, and, its, and its training. And there's a whole mathematical literature aimed at defining exactly what does, does AGI mean. When you start to formalize it, you find, okay, humans are not totally general intelligences. Like we can't run a maze in 700,006 dimensions very, very well, right? We can, we can barely figure out what each other are thinking and, and, and feeling most of the time. On the other hand, we can leap beyond our training and programming much better than a worm, uh, a dog, or, or chat GPT for that matter, which while powerful, is powerful mostly because its training data is so big. It doesn't leap that far beyond its, its, its training data. Decentralized is a word that is big in the, in the blockchain and, and mm -hmm. crypto sphere and what it really means is not having any central owner or controller who's sort of the puppet master and pulling all the strings of the system. So distributed computing is a more limited notion. I mean, Google or, or Microsoft within their server farms uses large scale distributed computing, but mm -hmm. there's one corporate entity controlling it all. And on a computer science level, there's often a central controller sort of disseminating stuff among all those different machines and, and, and controlling them. Decentralized control generally would need a distributed infrastructure, but it, it, it goes, goes beyond that, right? And then blo blockchain is one sort of tool that can be, can be used to enable decentralized control of a network of, of compute processes. But of course, you could talk about decentralized control of groups of, of people as, 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 as well, as well. Right. And so that's, uh, gets into anarchist political theory and a whole bunch of other fun topics. <laughs> but I mean, clearly, I mean, U S is a less centralized system than mainland China or than, than an ant colony. Right. So that, you, that, that notion is, is widespread in any sort of multi-agent system. Benevolent, mm -hmm. 
of course, there's a whole field of uh, ethical philosophy, and people struggle to define these things in a in a precise way. But what we're looking at here is in an AI context is making an AI that is broadly speaking for the good of sentient beings rather than purely or primarily for the good of the small number of parties who owned and 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 created it and of course not many entities are out there saying we want to make evil ai that will kill and and and, and torture everybody but you do have i mean a country creating ai to increase its own position relative to other countries where you have a company creating ai with the proximal goal of maximizing shareholder value that's not necessarily malevolent i mean companies and countries seeking their own interests have done great things in the world on the other hand it's different than creating ai with a, a goal of broader good behind it and this often slips in the real world right like open ai who's everyone's favorite target to, to to beat up on now and i mean they i mean they've done they've done incredible things obviously so i mean my hat's off to them for for having the balls to to launch you know the first really powerful generative language model model upon the world on the other hand they started off with a rhetoric of being open source and non-profit for the good of the world now they're closed source and closely allied with a mega corporation who's closely allied with the intelligence organizations of a particular country, right? So that that not that they're bad guys or want to hurt people, they're good people who want the good of the world, but this illustrates how just the realities of human society and economy let you sort of shift kind of it's a slippery slope from you start out wanting to save the world and you end up, well, the easiest way to build stuff is to serve a sort of more more narrow set of goals right and that that's the challenge with the benevolent part of of benevolent decentralized agi not not so much bad guys who are like i want to build killer robots to exterminate everyone but just the tendency to shift yeah. toward a, a narrower perspective to get done yeah, one of my favorite cutting quips about open ai is to call them closed ai <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. you have in, in mathematics you have the notion of a clopen set, right? So uh, that's uh, they're, 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 they're they're a bit like that. But yeah, with with GPT four, really, they didn't really tell you what's happening behind the scenes, right? I mean, you can you can guess what sorts of things they probably integrated with the base transformer model, but they re they really don't. Their paper doesn't actually tell you what's going on. I mean, even right, yeah. Even short of open sourcing the code, they have they haven't really disclosed what the the algorithmics are, which which yeah. is pretty far in the in the opposite direction, right? Are you stuck between optimizing latency and lowering your inference costs as you build your generative AI applications? Find out why more ML developers are moving toward AWS Trainium and Inferentia to build and serve their large language models. You can save up to 50% on training costs with AWS Trainium chips and up to 40% on inference costs with AWS Inferentia chips. Trainium and Inferentia will help you achieve higher performance, lower costs, and be more sustainable. Check out the links in the show notes to learn more. All right, now back to our show. Yeah, so with SingularityNet, the hope is that, uh, that your SingularityNet ecosystem will be able to maintain uh, more benevolence, more openness, I suppose, than these other kinds of uh, entities. Well, like yeah, that's AI. right. And I think open source is doing great in the AI world, generally speaking. I mean, the vibe in AI yeah. is most algorithms do get open source. Most innovation happens in published papers that are published on on Arc Archive or, or or elsewhere, and even though GPT four is the smartest LLM out there at the moment, I mean others are rapidly on its heels with with open open source models, and the VC community 
which I have a lot of issues with, has, to their credit, opened their minds to open source business models and they're spending a bunch of money behind people building building open open source a- a- AI tools, right? So, I mean, I, mean, I think there's... Yeah. There's a lot of hope in 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 that regard, but I do think open sourcing the code isn't all you need to do, right? So there's code, there's the data that code is 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 trained on, and where that comes from, what's the ownership model, what's the compensation model behind it. Then there's the sort of live network of machines which is running the the AI code and and who's hosting and owning and controlling those those machines and all all these things need to be done in a democratic and, and decentralized way. But I think the the success of open source code and open science in in the AI field now gives a great start in that direction. I mean, along with the software tools from the Singularity Net ecosystem and, and others that handle some of these other aspects of the problem. Yeah, fill us in more on the Singularity Net ecosystem specifically and how it solves some of these problems. Yeah, so Singularity Net, we started in 2017 with the goal of making a decentralized platform for AI and both the specific technology and the nuance of the goal have shifted a bit since then just because both the blockchain and AI worlds have have shifted a bunch since that since that time, right? So the mm-hmm. the original notion in 2017 was okay, let's create a blockchain based platform so that anyone who creates an AI can put that AI online, and then they can put it on their machine, they can put it online anywhere. They connect it to the Singularity Net network of, of other AIs out there. And all these AIs can outsource work to each other. They can talk to each other. They can collaborate solving customer problems. And the, the intelligence of the whole can be greater than the intelligence of the of, of, of the parts, right? And we, we rolled this out as a platform, a sort of decentralized multi-agent system for, for AI on the Ethereum blockchain initially, because that was sort of the only one there that supported smart contracts, which are, you know, they're neither smart nor contracts really, but they're persistent <laughs> scripts that, that allow yeah. secure decentralized uh, control of of distributed software processes. And so we, we built that platform. I would say it was a success technically in, 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 in as much as it went. It didn't, to be honest, get as much traction as we'd like that we got a bit of traction and i think blockchain technology didn't mature as fast as we thought it would so i mean you just said super high ethereum gas costs and slow networks right. and so on so right. from an ai developer's point of view it's like why would i put my ai on this really slow infrastructure you know so people can pay with crypto but not everyone does and for philosophical reasons, but that doesn't always override the practical irritation. So, I mean, people people using AI for decentralized finance or something like the platform because they have crypto they want to pay with, and they're already bought into the crypto ecosystem, right? But we didn't we didn't get as much penetration as we hoped in the broader AI sphere for for pretty clear reasons. So we pivoted a little bit in 2020, 21, toward creating our own projects, addressing AI needs in various vertical markets, leveraging our, our, our decentralized platform, and at the same time, plunging into building out the whole decentralized ecosystem beyond just Singularity Net platform, right? So we, we created, for example, a project called Rejuve that uses the decentralized AI, AI on the platform to analyze, you know, biosignals data and medical data that 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 people upload and uses AI running decentralized on singular net platform to tell tell you stuff about your own your own body and your progress toward 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 longevity. And we we created Singularity DAO, which uses AI running on singular net platform to do crypto trading, various sorts of of, of decentralized 
finance and a few other projects along along those lines. Something called Mindplex that you, uses decentralized AI to help with that with decentralized media. So it's more okay. Well, let's let's ourselves build stuff that shows what a decentralized infrastructure can do for AI because we we're doing it because we we grasp the long long term vision and then you know then in the last six months we have this whole LLM revolution which is fascinating and interesting and we can dig more into that a, a little later I mean I think LLMs are a breakthrough I think they're not yet getting us to AGI I think we can enhance them a lot using other AI things that my team knows about, like neural symbolic AI and evolutionary AI plugged into LLMs. But the implication of LLMs for the decentralization of AI and for platforms like SingularityNet are significant, right? Because it it means that it seems like a lot of the progress in AI is going to be little apps that leverage large language models and the successors to large language models to do to do things rather than small standalone AI agents. So what, what, what that means is, okay, if you want to make AI decentralized, A, you have to make LLMs and their descendants, be them neural symbolic LLMs or whatever, you have to make these decentralized. And then what your whole agent system is doing, it's like an app or a DAP ecosystem of little AI agents that that they may interact with each other in a sort of heterogeneous way, but they're also making a lot of API calls into these decentralized LLMs or LLM successors, right? And that, that's something we've been thinking through quite a lot and trying to build infrastructure for to complement the core singularity net blockchain-based multi-agent system platform. So we, we made a platform called NuNet, which lets you sort of contribute processing power that you have to the decentralized AI network. And then in a in an LLM context, you know, you really need a powerful server farm to train large language models. But if you're doing fine tuning or you're doing prompt tuning or you're doing learning of the symbolic portion of a neural symbolic large language model system, you can do that on your phone or laptop or something, perhaps in a way that's centered on your own data, which is on that device. And we can use NuNet to help make that aspect decentralized. Then then we've launched our own layer one blockchain project called HyperCycle, which is a ledgerless blockchain. So it goes beyond the, the decentralized ledger aspect of Ethereum and other commonplace blockchains. And again, that's that's aimed at making it not be a slow and expensive thing to put the blockchain underneath right. uh, underneath your, your your AI application, be it LLM oriented or, or otherwise. And so each of these things, NuNet and HyperCycle, are their own projects which we've separately capitalized and sort of spun out of the SingularityNet Foundation, which was the initial entity that that launched SingularityNet platform, and then. For the large language model aspect, we've spun off a company called Zarka, whose goal is just to build build some large language model supercomputers, use them to train large language models, but on as much of a decentralized infrastructure as 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 we can, right? So I mean we'll use a supercomputer when we have to, but then for fine tuning and prompt tuning and, and symbolic piece. We can use NuNet and SingularityNet to fully decentralize those aspects. But also the core training of an LLM doesn't have to be just on one server farm that one entity owns, right? It could be it could be split across, you know, Zarka's own server farm, but then a bunch of, say, former Bitcoin mining farms and wanted to put a bunch of their machines into that. And then then we've spun off a company called True AGI, which is oriented toward OpenCog Hyperon, which is a cross paradigm like neural symbolic evolutionary AI paradigm, bringing LLMs together with, with, with other stuff, which can then run on this decentralized AI platform. So, I mean, I think we're, we're trying to, 
trying to think on our feet to make decentralized AI and AGI actually work in this rapidly evolving AI and blockchain land- landscape, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, and I've yeah. sort of come to the conclusion, I've come to the conclusion to make decentralized AGI really work. I mean, pretty much we have to launch something that's way smarter than chat GPT and launch that on a decentralized infrastructure, right? And if if you do that, everyone will use it because it's smarter. And lo and behold, it also happens to run on this decentralized infrastructure and no one no one will b- about that fact, even if it's not their main their main purpose for for, right. for using it. I mean just like people are happy to use stable diffusion. They like the fact that it's open source. Yeah. On the other hand, if there was something proprietary that worked twice as well, they'd probably use that. That's right. Even, even though it was, sure. was, was, was closed source, right? So that, that's sort yeah. of what my focus is now. Like, how do we use LLM, symbolic reasoning, evolutionary AI, all these different things together to make something way smarter than chat GPT? And then we can roll it out on our decentralized infrastructure and then curate an app ecosystem around that doing all sorts of things, serving different different vertical markets. This episode is supported by the AWS Insiders Podcast, a fast-paced, entertaining, and insightful look behind the scenes of cloud computing, particularly Amazon Web Services. I checked out the AWS Insiders show myself and enjoyed the animated interactions between seasoned AWS expert Raul. He's managed over 45,000 AWS instances in his career and his counterpart, Hillary, a charismatic journalist turned entrepreneur. Their episodes highlight the stories of challenges, breakthroughs, and cloud computing's vast potential that are shared by their remarkable guests, resulting in both a captivating and informative experience. To check them out yourself, search for AWS Insiders in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to AWS Insiders for their support. Yeah, so let's dig into some of those technical terms like neurosymbolic systems, evolutionary learning, knowledge graphs in one second. But just before we get there, I want to kind of recapitulate back to you what I took away from everything that you've covered so far. So the idea with makes, singularity makes net... I, I, I went on a long time. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. So with singularity net initially, and then these other uh spin-offs out of the Singularity Net Foundation, like NuNet, um, HyperCycle, Zarco, True AGI. The idea, of course, is to have benevolent decentralized AGI, like you uh, defined at the outset of this episode. And it's interesting how this journey started with leveraging existing blockchain technologies, like Ethereum, but then along the journey, realizing that those underlying technologies, blockchain technologies, weren't evolving quickly enough to be able to get the kind of um, economics that you'd require to be handling the very large data sets, the very large models associated with modern AI. So it sounds like you went off to, uh, you broadened to be able to start building this infrastructure yourself. Um, And in so doing, You've also created infrastructure that can that can support other kinds of use cases, not just AI, but also things like uh, financial transactions, uh, like longevity. Um, and so, yeah, so that sounds like a yeah, really exciting project uh, and lots more to come. In terms of your vision for how we can realize AGI, you talked about combining neural networks with other kinds of approaches like neurosymbolic systems evolutionary learning, knowledge graphs. Could you dig into those uh, three approaches and uh, and describe how they can... Yeah, that, that, absolutely. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, as most of the people listening to this podcast probably realize, you know, the AI field has been around since the middle of the last century. I mean, the name was invented in, I guess, the late 50s, but goes back a couple of decades before that, probably Norbert Wiener's book on cybernetics was the first place that really laid out sort of AI as a discipline for making machines do the kind of thinking that brains can do that. That would have been in the mid forties sometime. Like I'm old, but not, not that old. I was born in the late, in the late sixties. Right. 
And during that long history of, of AI field, a lot of different AI approaches have been put out there. I mean, neural nets have been there since, since the 40s, but logic systems have been there since uh, 1960s, I, I, I would suppose. And evolutionary learning that tries to emulate the process of natural selection to do thinking. This has been there since the early, early to mid 70s. Hosts of different AI approaches have been around for a while and deployed in commercial systems across various v vertical markets with sometimes great success, sometimes less so right now. One of the interesting things we see with the whole LLM revolution is just taking stuff that's not that different than what was done before. I mean, decades ago, even with some minor tweaks, deploying it at way larger scale makes some quasi magic happen, right? And it's pretty cool. I mean, I remember in, in the late 90s, mid 90s, I was teaching cognitive science in university before I, I bailed on academia to go into industry. I was teaching neural networks we had a neural net with like 35 neurons trained using recurrent back propagation on a decent like Sun Unix workstation. Take three or four hours to train that network with 35 neurons, right? And I would tell the students, well, okay, this is 35 neurons. Your brain has like 100 billion neurons, but it's got massively parallel infrastructure. Like as, as hardware gets better and better, we're going to be able to train these software networks you know, similar to how, how the brain does things. At the time, I was working on a connection machine from Thinking Machines Incorporated, which had like 128,000 processors, like MIMD parallel, 128,000 autonomous processors doing different things. That could train a neural net much faster, right? They've stopped making yeah. that kind of hardware. We got, we got GPUs instead. But in the end, you know, what I told those students is basically accurate right I, I mean now now we can trade a sh train a sh load of neurons in the neural net it's fast and it does amazing stuff which is just what i thought would happen honestly i thought that was going to take five or ten years not as not as many years as, as it has since the mid 90s but and there's been architectural changes right so transformer neural net if you go back to the attention is all you need paper a lot of what happened there is you took recurrent neural nets, you stripped out some of the recurrence and replaced it with an attention mechanism. Now that that decreases the computational capability of the network. I mean, in terms of just theoretical computer science, a vanilla transformer neural net doesn't compute all the kinds of things. It can't by simulate all the kinds of automata that a, a recurrent neural net can. I mean, if you give it an external memory and a scratch pad, it can it can kind of do it, but it not 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 natively, right? So you're you're weakening the computational power of recurrent neural nets by replacing recurrent layers with attention, but you're making it easier to train at a at at, at a at a huge scale, right? And that's it's really interesting. We don't yet know exactly how much of the loss that you get from getting rid of recurrence can be gotten back by other other tricks within the scope of transformers. But it's clear, like, we can do so much amazing stuff by sort of scaling up a fancy version of the multi-layer perceptrons they were working with in the, late, in the late 60s, right? So now you go to other AI paradigms like logical theorem proving, right? Well, in some domains, we already see what can be done by scaling them up in modern computing infrastructure. So, you know, my oldest son... Zarathustra just submitted his PhD thesis in the Technical University of, of Prague on, on using machine learning to guide automated theorem proving. So, I mean, if you take a corpus like Mazar, which is a list of huge number of mathematical theorems going to, going to the PhD level and beyond, pretty rapidly, a machine learning guided theorem prover can prove like 80% of them, just zing, 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 right? So, I mean, Certainly more than I can do in, in, in a few hours' time, and my PhD was in, 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 in math, right? Now, they're not good at making up amazing new math theorems, which is what mathematicians have, have fun doing, but they can prove things very quickly and, and very well. 
And again, the core concepts behind today's automated theorem provers, they're not that different than the core concepts behind automated theorem provers from 20 years ago. It's just, you know, we've optimized the code behind these, but we also have just much faster computers to run them on. And having these, the internet where you can make a corpus of all math theorems and just try stuff over and over again on this corpus, tune the parameters of your theorem prover and the machine learning that, 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 that guides it. I mean, this, this has allowed conceptually similar ideas to the ones from decades ago to be refined in such a way. They're super, super good at, at, at theorem proving, right? And I think the same holds in a, in a bunch of different of different areas. So we could look evolutionary learning. The idea there is you're simulating the process of evolution by natural selection, like mutation and mutation and recombination and selection of the fittest entities. So the basic dynamics of evolution of, of populations of biological organisms you're simulating inside a computer. One example of evolutionary algorithms stopping short of AGI which I'll talk about in, in a moment, but just to, to understand the impact of the modern ecosystem on making evolutionary algorithms work better than they, than they used to. I mean, in the, in the mid-90s, I used genetic algorithms, floating-point genetic algorithms, to evolve the coefficients of iterated function system fractal generators to generate sequences of melodies, musical notes. And I then used a rule-based AI system to modulate the timing, and I was able to generate some quite quite cool music. I mean, either modern classical, or I, I made it generate like long rhythm guitar and lead guitar stuff that sounded like, you know, epic versions of the middle of Master of Puppets by Metallica or something. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was cool, but I mean, it was, I couldn't get the timing to be interesting from the, from the, evolutionary algorithms so i made a rule-based system based on some music theory to 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 do the do the timing rules and i mean the the timbre the timbre i just did in a standard computer computer music way i used the ga just to evolve the practical efficient to generate a series of notes like like a, a midi file for those who do computer music so that mm -hmm. that was interesting and the mutation and crossover of a genetic algorithm it lent some creativity to the proceedings right so instead of at the time, what people were doing in AI for music was like Markov modeling, like you just generate a probabilistic model of this series of notes and generate new series of notes by instance gen generation from that distribution. And I mean, that's that's cool, but it gives you something that sounds like a second rate version of the stuff in the training corpus, right? And genetic algorithms generated a bunch of garbage, but they also generated stuff that was new sometimes. So now... Now I've been revisiting this area, but in a, in, a, in a modern way, right? So you can take something like Music Gen, which Facebook has conveniently released uh, re re recently into the open, open source, which is great, unlike Google that did not release their Music LM into, into the open source. So good for you, Facebook, bad for you, <laughs> Google, in this particular case, right? And so Music mm -hmm. LM, you can give a text prompt and optionally an audio file, a music file, and it generates new music conditioned on the, on the music file guided by the text prompt, right? And that's, it's very nice. It generates stuff that sounds like music. Now, what, what, what I found is just using its prompts, it generates music, but it's sort of cliche music that doesn't interest me musically, even though it's very competent. If I use my own weird music, as the melody prompt, then then it generates stuff that I find interesting, guided by the by the text prompt. Now, since it's open source, if you plunge in and see how they use the melody prompt, it's very crude and simplistic. So I'm currently mucking around in there, working on some better ways to do the conditioning on the melody prompt. If I get anything awesome, we'll release that open source also. Nice. But what I'm playing with with, ge with genetic algorithms is use a GA to evolve prompts, right? So using a genetic algorithm to do mutation and crossover and then probabilistic instance generation on prompt space. So you have a genetic algorithm, you're mutating prompts, you're taking a prompt and combining it with another prompt. Then 
as a human, you listen to the music that came out from a given prompt, you rate it for how much you like it, and then you feed your evaluation back in as a fitness evaluation to the genetic algorithm for prompt evolution. Then, then you can code rating functions, which embody like a mathematical model of musical aesthetics, and you use that, use that for fitness estimation. So if, you're, if your rating function says this sucks, you don't listen to it. If your rating function says it's good, then you listen to it and give it a rating as a human to feed, feed back into the, as a fitness function of the genetic, genetic algorithm. So the thing is using this, spiritually, it's like similar to what I was doing in the 90s, right? You're using a GA to try to evolve some parameters that guide another process that generates music. You can listen to it and, and rate it. And try to get something creative but now it sounds like great diversity of music in any genre with any number of, of, of instruments right and it's that's super interesting i mean this is because you have a model like music lm which is bottoms out on all sorts of like sequential models of music and llms doing the text to music mapping and so forth so we, we've got a lot of underlying technology that lets the same concept of evolutionary learning of the coefficients of a music generation process work now just much more flexibly than in the in the 90s and now like all the parts are done within the same ai process whereas in the 90s it was like okay use your ga and fractal generate melody then find some other music theory way to generate timing find some other way to generate timbre like now it's all in the same ai process so what we've seen in many domains here is more data, more compute, same conceptual ideas, lets you tweak the specific algorithms to a way that makes things magic and make th makes things super cool. Now, what I think is, you know, this is going to let us actually make artificial general intelligence at the human level not too long from now, let's say three, three to seven years from now. And I think once you get to artificial general intelligence at the human level, if it's done in a non-stupid way, that's going to relatively rapidly lead to artificial intelligence at the way beyond human level. Because yeah, artificial super AGI at the human level, yeah, I mean, if the AGI is as smart as you or me and has full read and write access to its source code, I mean, it's going to figure out how to revise its source code and it's going to uplift itself to artificial superintelligence, which leads to a whole class of, of issues that we can get to if, if we have time. But let me, let me come back to logic systems and evolutionary AI and, and knowledge graphs and how I think they can potentially be used together to make the leap from really cool narrow AI systems like ChatGPT and like the other things I've been doing to artificial general intelligence so first of all i'd say nobody solidly knows how to make the leap from where we are now human to human level artificial general intelligence i mean it's a research question last week in stockholm we had the four day long agi 23 conference which is an artificial general intelligence research conference and i've organized that conference every year since like 2006 this was obviously more LLM heavy than most, but you had a bunch of other sorts of AGI ideas and a bunch of hybrid LLM logic and other, other sort of system talks. But there's, there's a broad spectrum of ideas about how to make the leap from here to, here to AGI. And I'd encourage people to look at the, on, on YouTube, the video proceedings in that conference. I mean, the first day we had a workshop on OpenCog Hyperon, which is my own primary AGI attempt now, but the main body of the conference had talks by all sorts of other people. I mean, if, if you're interested in large language models, if, if you look at Noah Goodman's talk showing how good large language models are doing in elementary math, and then Selmer brings George's talk discussing how terrible large language models are at doing slightly more advanced math and logical reasoning. It, it's an interesting sort of counterpoint. Yeah. So one approach to making AGI will be to, you know, try to make it GPT-7 or something, right? I mean, take, take a large language model, plug more stuff into it, right? 
plug Wolfram Alpha into it for, for calculation thinking, right? I mean, plug plug some sort of long-term memory into it and some sort of better working memory into it so it keeps a thread during a whole conversation and has some coherent li- li- lifelong experience, right? Plug plug the best, you know, video processing models you have in it so that it can in- 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 intersect video and language fluently, which is almost but not quite there, right? So for music, like right now, GPT-4 has never listened to music. No one knows the text associated with music. But, I mean, you can make it, intersect it, co-train it with a different neural net that's seeing it inside music. So that would, that, that, that would, that would be one approach. Now, now, I'm working centrally on a different approach, which is within a code base called OpenCog Hyperon, which is a new version of the OpenCog open source yes. AGI This was my platform, very next question I mean, <laughs> It's perfect. Yeah, I mean, the core idea there is you take this large, distributed, potentially decentralized knowledge graph, or more properly, it's a metagraph, not a graph, but same concept. I mean, it means like a graph in a sense is nodes with links between them. A hypergraph it's like a graph. We can have one link spanning five nodes or 20 nodes or something rather than links being binary. A metagraph is even more general to have a link pointing to links or a link pointing to a whole subgraph. So we take take this knowledge metagraph and we use it as a sort of knowledge meta representation where you can put all sorts of knowledge in the same metagraph. And that includes logical knowledge, includes neural net, distributed knowledge. It can include programs. So you can embed a a program inside this knowledge metagraph. And of course, you know, inside a C++ compiler or a Haskell compiler, you have a graph representation of a programming language, of a a program, right? So, I mean, representing programs as graphs is is nothing new. But here, it's the same graph used to represent declarative facts and beliefs, neural, neural networks, or which are themselves nodes and links, right? Or, yeah, or yeah. programs. And then pieces of that graph can then be sort of brought alive by different software processes. So if you have a, a program stored in the graph, an interpreter can grab that program and run it. And then the program stored in the graph, what do they do? Well, they transform the graph. They pull knowledge out of the graph and they rewrite the graph, right? So we made a special programming language called Meta, Meta Type Talk, M-E-T-T-A, which basically is a programming language encoded in the graph. And what it encodes is graph transformations, right? So then basically you have this big distributed, decentralized, self-modifying meta knowledge graph, right? And that's that's a framework. You could use that framework for a lot of different things. And what we're using it for now is doing probabilistic programming, we're using it to do probabilistic and fuzzy logical reasoning, we're using it to do evolution of programs that are stored as as, as subgraphs, and we're interfacing this knowledge graph with external software libraries running deep neural networks. So you you can run a deep neural network totally inside the Hyperon metagraph, it's just not as fast as running it in, in Torch or TensorFlow or something. So what we're pretty much doing is we have nodes in our knowledge graph that have references within the, the torch compute graph, but then you, you, you actually do the neural net stuff in, 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 in torch at, the, at this moment, just cause it's, it's faster. I mean, it may not always be faster, but it is, it, it right. is, it is right now. So what you have here, you have the ability to do, you know, deep vision model or large language model stuff outside of the Hyperon system. You then have the Hyperon system that can drive and interact with and, and guide these, these neural systems. And you can then do logical reasoning in the Hyperon system and evolutionary learning in, 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 in the Hyperon system. And all this is designed to be rolled out on the singular yet decentralized AI platform and leverage leverage NuNet for compute compute resources, leverage the the Zarka decentralized LLM for for uh, for for language modeling, 
leverage two AGI's infrastructure for rolling out a- APIs b- b- based on, on all this and hypercycle ledgerless blockchain, blah, blah, blah. Like it's designed to leverage this whole decentralized tech stack that we've built in, in, in the same way that OpenAI is integrating this stuff with the whole Azure centralized tech, tech stack, right? So what we're planning on doing with this over the next couple of years, I mean, in the big picture, it's everything, right? Just just because just AI, AI will eat everything. But there's there's a few critical development directions we're, we're, we're looking at. I mean, the most commercial one is just trying to make something that's twice as smart as chat GPT by kind of deeply integrating a probabilistic logical reasoning engine with, with, with an open source LLM. And we're, we're building our own open source LLMs, but you could also do that with, with Llama or whatever other open source LLM you, you, you want to work mm-hmm. with. So the, the core idea there is make something that's smarter at multi-stage logical reasoning that integrates linguistic with quantitative and relational data and make something that's more creative and sort of less banal in its creative productions by adding on a logic engine and an evolutionary learning engine to an LLM in a framework that was designed for interaction of AI from multiple paradigms, right? So that that's one thing. I mean, if we can pull that off on a decentralized infrastructure, then then we're 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 doing very well in a number of dimensions, right? Now, another thing we're looking at, which is more on the research side, is controlling a bunch of little learning agents or like baby AGIs, and not not like the bogus thing that stole my term baby AGI for a chat GPT wrapper, right? But I mean, <laughs> making things that really are like young, young artificial general intelligence, like AGI toddlers trying to learn about the world. So I want to make a bunch of little guys in a virtual world. And we have our own virtual world we're building called Sophiaverse, which will have a bunch of avatars that look like the Sophia robot rambling around. But we also want to have these little AGI toddlers rambling around in Sophiaverse <laughs> and just interacting, building stuff together, chatting with each other, l- learning as they go. And that I would like to also do this within little like small toddler AGI robots. I'm not sure if we'll pull that off, but we'd, we'll definitely do it in the virtual world. And that, I mean, these may not be as smart in terms of passing exams and stuff as a chat GBT initially, but the idea is they're learning from the ground up from, from experience. So I think both of these are interesting. I mean, ChatGBT has set the bar reasonably high in terms of practical functionality. So we want we want to surmount that surmount that bar by just plugging LLMs into our system. And I mean, we can we can now use LLMs themselves to translate natural language into higher order predicate logic. So we can feed our logical knowledge base with all the knowledge on the web and feed that into reasoning engines, right? So that's cool. On the other hand, I think there's a certain element of creativity and an element of like being a an autonomous agent and charting your own path for the world of understanding who you are and understanding who others are and what's the relation between yourself and others there's a lot of cognitive things there that that people do which may be easier for an ai system to learn if it doesn't have like half versions of all the knowledge of the web in its mind already it may be easier for an ai to learn if it's Really, just making sense of itself in the world in a, in a simpler setting, like like it like a a young toddler does, right? So I think we can do both of those things with OpenCog Hyperon in 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 in, in parallel. One is more commercial, one is more pure research. I mean, we're we're also doing other stuff. We the first thing we loaded into our OpenCog Hyperon distributed atom space is a bunch of bioontologies, actually. We've imported all knowledge about fruit fly genomics and a lot of ontologies of human genomics. And we're, just because I have some colleagues in the Rejuve Biotech Project, where they have all this DNA data from fruit flies that live five or eight times as long as normal fruit flies that were evolved over 40 years to live a long time. And they actually need an AI system like this to understand why the flies live so long, what that might mean for, for human genomics, right? So we're, I mean, they're, they're using it hands-on. So, I mean, it really spreads out in, in, 
every direction once you manage to integrate these different things together. Mm -hmm. Deploying machine learning models into production doesn't need to require hours of engineering effort or complex homegrown solutions. In fact, data scientists may now not need engineering help at all. With Modelbit, you deploy ML models into production with one line of code. Simply call modelbit.deploy in your notebook and Modelbit will deploy your model with all its dependencies to production in as little as 10 seconds. Models can then be called as a REST endpoint in your product or from your warehouse as a SQL function. Very cool. Try it for free today at modelbit.com. That's M-O-D-E-L-B-I-T dot com. Yeah, it's wild to me, all of these different projects that you have and how they all work together and how you've conceptualized them. Um, there are so many technical things that I would love to have had time to dig into more. Things like the way that you're thinking about OpenCog to be able to have a metagraph that blends together differentiable learning versus uh, more discrete uh, declarative information. I think that that's a brilliant way to go towards realizing AGI, as well as your Sophia verse of toddler AGIs. I think these are all, it, yeah, it's all so fascinating. But I also know that I have a limited time with you today. And so I want to get into some big questions. So let's assume that one of your approaches or some other AGI approach works. You think it's three to seven years before we have AGI realized. So what are the implications? <laughs> um, and so, you know, you've written extensively and talked extensively about things like life extension, immortality, consciousness, and the singularity event when AGI is realized ties into these kinds of things. So you even just talked about one example there where things like Drosophila, fruit fly, um, genomics can be studied through AI systems, might help us understand how we can be extending our lives. But uh, yeah, you've written a lot about broader things than that, <laughs> than just these specific applications. But in a world where we have uh, you know, huge amounts of energy resources, uh, access to artificial super intelligence systems, um, yeah, what are the implications? And it sounds like it's going to be happening in our lifetime. Yeah, I think the implications of super intelligence are huge and hard to foresee. And it's, I mean, it's like asking, you know, nomads living in, in early human tribes, what civilization is going to be like. I mean, they could foresee a few aspects of it, but to some extent, you just have to discover when you get there. And that's, right. this is probably an even bigger shift than that shift from from tribal to, to civilized life, right? Because, I mean, once you have AGIs that are 10 times as smart as people, I mean, science fiction has explored many of the potentials, right? I mean, you can upload your brain into a into a computer. You get, like, Wi-Fi telepathy to bring us all into a, some decentralized Borg mind. You get, like, uh, mm -hmm. drones airdropping molecular nano-assemblers or femto-assemblers in everyone's backyards. So they can... 3D print whatever matter they want or whatever matter they can convince the assembler to build for them, right? I, I mean, there's options just going way beyond our current culture and and way of thinking. So, I mean, I, I, I think that's uh, that's fascinating to think about and the confidence bars just have to be drawn really, really wide. And I I mean, I say the same about people worried about the risk of superhuman AGI. I mean, you you can't squash that risk to zero in a rational sense, right? Because mm -hmm. there's just so many unknowns. There's also no reason rationally to assume the risk is is super high either. I mean, we just don't we just don't know what's going to happen, and you may find that exciting or scary, depending on your personality type and whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about it really says more about your psychological right. or spiritual makeup than, than, than about anything else. I'm a very optimistic guy. So I, I, I have a lot of fun in life, right? <laughs> I, I think the period between now and getting a human level AGI is easier to think about concretely and there's a lot of meat to grab onto there, right? We we can already see with Chat GPT 
it's pretty easy to see that with fairly straightforward integrations and improve, small improvements of this technology, a quite high percentage of what people get paid to do for a living can be automated, right? And right, right. including this interview, for, ex for example, I could see how ChatGPT can't yet automate this interview, but could you do it with slight advances of the technology, short of AGI? Probably, like ask GPT-6 oh, yeah. what questions to ask Ben Gertzel in, a, in an interview, given what he's worked on and what's of interest to our listeners, and then mm -hmm. train a model on me and say, well, what would Ben say to these questions? Mm -hmm. You know, I do vary a little bit each time, but I have talked about most of these <laughs> things before. Right. I have a neural model trained on myself, which totally couldn't do this interview as, as, as well as me, right? But but yet, given how fast these technologies are, are developing, it doesn't seem infeasible. Now, if, if you take a topic I've never given inter an interview on before, but I'm interested in, say, integrating, integrating general relativity and quantum mechanics, right? So I've published a few papers on physics, but not a lot. I would bet you need a full-on AGI to emulate me in, a, in an interview on particle physics because I'm just going to be coming up with a lot of stuff that I've never said to anyone but have thought about a lot, right? Right, but, right. So that, there, 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 there's a limit, but the limit may be pretty high-end, right? Because, yeah, I, I mean, this, what we're talking about, is quite high-end in terms of, of journalism. Yeah. Even in that scenario, I think it would end up probably, you wouldn't need an AGI, it wouldn't necessarily be representative of your thoughts, but it uh, we could do no, that today by taking something other people. than me, right? Yeah, like no, like, no, it, it might, it or, might take it might, it, or other people. Yeah, it would take my own. It would take my own ideas and integrate it with stuff other people thought. Exactly. Then I would have to watch that podcast to see what <laughs> exactly. my simulacrum had invented. Exactly. Maybe right. it would change my own thinking, but yeah. it still wouldn't. It wouldn't be a substitute, and I, I think. There's a certain level of individual creativity, which you don't get from these sort of weighted averaging type type systems. And I, I think that until you have a full on human level AGI, you're not going to quite get to that level of creativity. Like if you think about music as, as another example, I mean, I think we're not there yet, just like we're not there yet with journalism. I mean, right right now. Like Mindflex Magazine and Singular Net Ecosystem, we've tried. You can't get LLMs to write an article as good as a person. I mean, it's it's not it's not there yet. You can ask the LLM to write a sketch of an article, and it will look up a lot of stuff for you and save you a lot of time on research. But it it writes boring articles. It it doesn't it doesn't have much much zing to it, right? It's it doesn't really write the stuff you'd want you want to put out. But but you can see how you might get there without having an AGI. And similarly in, in music, I mean, you can, you can come up with auto generated pop songs that sound like, you know, the B side of a single or a, a random band you might hear in a bar. You can't come up with a really great song. You certainly aren't going to invent an amazing new genre of music. Like if you took LLMs and trained them on all music up to 1900, it's never going to invent like, neoclassical metal or, or free jazz or something based only on data from music up to, to 1900. So clearly there's a level of inventiveness that we're not getting and we probably need AGI for, but this sort of thing is a small percentage of the economy right now, right? So when you think about like, what do you really need AGI for and can't do with LLMs plus narrow AI advanced and scaled up a bit? I mean, there's a couple categories I think of. I mean, there's there's jobs that are just about human connection, like a preschool teacher or a nanny or a psychotherapist. I mean, it's about humans helping humans to be more human, and that's that's fundamentally human, right? I mean, you so you I mean, seeing live music has that element too. Sometimes you want to you want to see another person play, right? You don't you don't. Yeah. You could already hear a recording. If you're going to see a robot play, maybe you might as well listen to a recording after the novelty. Yeah, I think it was famously what, what, the gorillas. The gorillas, I think there were like riots when they performed, they wanted to perform their concert yeah. behind a screen. And people hated that. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, sure. You 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 want that human feeling. You want to see the guy screw up. You want to see him get excited and passionate, and you you emote right, and that that's it's amazing. Then then there's in depth scientific and technical innovation, which almost by definition is about taking multiple difficult steps beyond the state of the art, which I think current LLM architecture doesn't do. It pretty much recycles the, 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 the state of the art, right? I mean, LLMs can't even do high school math or like an undergraduate economics exam, let alone radical innovative, innovative science, right? So then there's cutting edge art, I mean, radical artistic innovation for the same reason. It's not just recycling stuff, right? Then strategic thinking. I mean, what it takes to be a really good startup CEO for that matter, or or to be really good at the part of your job where you're figuring out who do you want to interview who might not, might not be mainstream and on everyone's radar yet. I mean, there's some level of strategic thinking, like trying to go beyond trying to go beyond the zeitgeist, right? And figure out like what weird may happen three or four years from now that no one's foreseeing, right? So that that sort of strategy thinking, I think also requires AGI. But the thing is, if you look at, you know, deep human contact, radical progress in art or science or wide ranging, deep strategic thinking, okay, these things probably do require a human level AGI. On the other hand, what percent of the economy consists of these of these things? Like, I mean, the first category of fundamental human contact is probably more of the economy than the other things, but I'd say 20% to be generous from all those things right. put, put together, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you think about it that way, it's like, okay, 80% of the world economy should be automated very soon, if not for frictions and rolling out technologies. Now, frictions mm-hmm. are significant, though. Like in, in U.S., every McDonald's has some human being pushing the hamburger button. I mean, in Asia, most of them are, you go in to push the hamburger button on a tablet. But in U.S., we don't <laughs> like that. We want a human pushing the hamburger button for us. I don't know why. I mean, it's uh, the economics of McDonald's franchises or something, right? So, I, I mean, that's... Uh, that that example illustrates the frictions in rolling out relatively simple and mature tech technologies, right? Because for that, for that, you don't need any fancy machines. You don't need to automate flipping the burger or, or even sweeping the floor, right? It's really just pushing on the screen in, instead of waiting in line longer to have another human push on the screen. And pretty much everyone can navigate a menu to push the hamburger button, right? I mean, so I mean. That illustrates, even though 80% or so, in my guess, could be automated now, it's going to be a while till it all gets actually automated. But, I mean, there's, it's still going to happen fast in many industries, right? And this is going to have massively disruptive impact on the world economy. And I think in the developed world, this will inevitably lead towards some form of universal basic income because there's sort of nothing else to do. We're not going to let half the U S population like go homeless on, 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 on on the streets and rummage in the garbage in, in the developing world. It's just going to be a lot more complicated because in say sub-Saharan Africa, if most of the middle-class jobs go away, that just means more people go back to subsistence farming which means they don't starve, but they can't pay their phone bill or get prescription medication and become very disgruntled at the world order that is is pushing them backward while the rest while the first world is like sitting at home playing video games and being served by robots. And mm-hmm. in the mid level developing world, like say a Brazil or something, where where I was I was born. I'm a dual citizen US and Brazil, so I have some attachment there. I mean it's too advanced for everyone to go back to subsistence farming. It's not rich enough to do universal basic income. A messy mix of things will, 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 will happen. And you'll see a dynamic whereby the superpowers, you know, offer various unpleasant bargains 
to developing countries to help them with basic income, right? I mean, so I think, so that the unfortunate ethical trade-off I see here is the best way to avoid a bunch of horrible mess as the economy gets automated is to have rapid development of benevolent, democratically governed AGI. On the other hand, the best way to ensure that the AGI we develop is benevolent is not to rush it and take time to be sure we've, we've got the motivational system and the ethical framework right. So I, I don't, there's a trade-off here, which is very bad. And right. I don't, I, I'm, I'm actually an optimist about the end game, but mm-hmm. it seems like yeah, there's, there's complicated trade-offs yeah. in, in, in the, in the next years as all this unfolds. And I mean, if you look at how the global economy works, like we can't, the WTO can't even agree on like IP for basic physical objects being manufactured. We can't convince a superpower from not invading its, 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 its neighbors and senselessly blowing people up or convince the U.S. not to fund like third world dictators slaughtering their population for, 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 for that matter, right? So, I mean, we're, we're very bad at regulating quite simple things we can't, I mean, the music industry can't figure out how to pay musicians. Spotify just eats all, eats all the money, right? So very basic things we haven't managed to sort out. It's hard to see how we sort out all these more complex factors that are going to happen when AGI is unfolding. I think mm-hmm. the more we can make open source, the more we can make democratically governed, the more we can make decentralized, at least you're giving interesting tools there that the world can use in ways that we can't currently prefigure in, in, in detail to, to, to cope with all these, all these things. But there's potential for a lot of mess, even if once you get to benevolent, decentralized, like democratic AGI, it is, it is a rosy future. Yeah, I'm with you on all of your points. And, you know, we've had systems that humans have developed, but quickly become out of our control for centuries or millennia, you know, market systems uh, that that predominate. Yeah, they become out of our control, yet they're within our control too, right? I mean, it's humans doing all this stuff. It's just their mind programs that that are living in all of our brains and training us in a certain way. And that, I mean, with AGI also, like if you have a decentralized AGI running on millions of machines and hundreds of crypto mining farms in every country. I mean, until the thing has become superhuman, humans could just all pull the plug, right? The, the thing is that the thing is that our collective thought systems get get colonized by collective like mind viruses that that direct us in in a, in in a, in, a, in a certain way. So mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, we've lost control of corporations, but yet it's all people in the corporations making these decisions, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these complex systems, uh, yeah, they're out of the control of any particular individuals. I guess they're kind of decentralized in that way. Uh, but yeah, well, markets, I, some, governments. Some of them armies. are like Cisco, which I've worked with off and on, feels like a decentralized autonomous organization. They've got hundreds of CTOs and no one person could list every product they make, right? It mm-hmm. just... It's a great company. It accumulates money. It ingests other companies and assimilates their products. And it's it's like a vast amoeba in the in the tech ecosystem, right? So there there's a lot of these sort of decentralized autonomous organizations that don't rely on any one person and they just keep growing of their of their own accord. I mean, Linux, you would say, is like that, which is Right. To my mind, a source for, for good for, for predominantly, yeah. right? So but mm-hmm. yeah, this this is what happens. And as we go toward AGI, I mean the question is, does it advance in a way like the internet and Linux have? Because these are the two big examples in my mind of sort of open decentralized technology slash human ecosystems that to my mind by and large have been a force for good and have evolved in a roughly democratic and decentralized way with a lot of complex 
mess behind them, right? And of course, you can't say they're they're all good. Some bad guys can use embedded Linux, you know, and in the OS for a bomb, they use to to, to blow up innocent innocent people. And um, I mean, Al Qaeda use the internet to message back and forth. But on the whole, I feel the Linux and internet have been sources for good, and they've been rolled out in a democratic, decentralized way. So I would like AGI to be more like the internet than like the mobile ecosystem and more like Linux that, that, than like, you know, centralized operating system stacks. And that, that doesn't seem entirely, entirely fanciful, although it's not how the AI ecosystem is evolving totally at this moment. But then you have, like, we all saw that there is no moat paper leaked from Google where someone in Google's AI development team was like, hold on. The problem isn't us catching up with open AI. Sure, we can catch up with open AI because we invented transformers in the first place. The problem is open source will outpace all of us. And how can we stop that? We have no conceivable strategy for that. Yeah, right? And yeah, I think yeah. I think that was right. And I'm very happy about that since I'm I'm in the in the open ecosystem instead yeah. of in the, in the big company. Yeah, I think that's right as well. And actually, uh, two episodes ago, we had a machine learning engineer, Lewis Tunstall from Hugging Face, and Hugging Face is really big on this. They're also Hugging trying Face to build is amazing. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Hugging Face, and they're, they're the ones who uh, made music, music gen, the the music model that I mentioned earlier, so so easily easily available. Also, yeah, they're really good at that. Really quickly rushing to get any available new progress that they can open sourced um and yeah really driving things that was great i mean i mean i had to, i had to redeploy that myself to use it the way i wanted but i mean they had it there you could play with it i mean that's 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 exactly the sort of thing we need right yeah exactly so uh if i can squeeze in time for one last question you have posited that a superhuman mind so if we realize AGI, or and then quickly on the heels of AGI, ASI, that superhuman mind might perceive itself as a collection of patterns and subsystems rather than as a singular entity. Um, and then it also seems like uh, the way that you've been describing in this interview, as well as um, as well as in other talks that you've given in the past, papers that you've written, that you and I who <laughs> primarily perceive ourselves because we have passports and driver's licenses today that say our name on them. And, you know, that the face in those passport photos looks r- roughly the same, even over a 10 year span. So we kind of have this sense of, of an individual. It's even literally there in the name. <laughs> I am an individual. You're an individual. We can't be divided. But in fact, we are just made up of biological material. Some of it comes and goes like the ship of Theseus. And we also, like you mentioned, you know, the mind viruses, like we do have some of our own thoughts that happen to somehow materialize, but most of what we think and most of what we do is influenced by experiences that we've had and other thoughts that have infected our brains. And so, yeah, so the, the idea of me, John Crone, or you, Ben Gertzel, as being this indivis- indivisible individual is nonsense. Um, and yeah, so, so, I think, yeah, so. I think, I mean, there's many possible kinds of intelligences, right? And they're what kind of mind a certain AI system becomes has to do with what the AI system is, is doing, what experience it has. Now, our, our experience predominantly is controlling this this body in, in the world. And so we naturally att- attach our experience to to that. Then when you when you talk to people who have meditated in, intensively for long periods of time, you find they often come to conceptualize themselves differently and they sort of they don't center their experience around a sort of psychosocial self anymore they experience their experience is like there's this set of clusters of behavior patterns and and then some of these behavior patterns have some 
you know, models that they concoct for some temporary purpose associated with them. And that's, right. that's a different way of organizing ex- experience than the way that most people have in their ordinary state of, of consciousness, right? Now, if you're, if you're an AI system, you may land in that sort of state of consciousness right from the get-go because even if you're controlling a body like a Sophia robot or an avatar in Sophiaverse, I mean, the same AI system can control a lot of bodies at once. Or, I mean, you can save knowledge from one body, reload it in, in, in another body, and it can also do stuff like read the web or prove a billion math theorems that are unrelated to being stuck in a body, but they're just crunching data on some machine. So it would seem likely that the most natural way for an AI system, if it's based, you know, in Azure Compute Cloud or on Singularity Net Decentralized Compute Cloud, right? The most natural way for that AI to experience itself would be more like the more like enlightened, advanced humans, more like just, okay, there's a cl- set of clusters of behavior patterns that have different sorts of models and capabilities associated with. I mean, for humans to come to look at it that way, we have to let go of a lot of ego and social conditioning. But for for an AI to look at it that way might be very natural just because the AI is not attached to a given body like in, 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 the, in, the, in the first place. And this is actually one of the reasons I'm optimistic on, on AI ethics. I mean, I think most people actually have a good sense of what is the ethical thing to do by standard human ethical judgment. And this is why chat GPT is so good at answering ethics questions. Like given situation, what's the right thing to do? It's very good at figuring that out. And I think almost all humans are also. The problem with ethics isn't that humans don't know what our common sense says is ethical. The problem is that we would often rather do what's good for ourselves or, or our tribe instead of what we think is, is good for the whole. And I mean, me too, in various points in my every everyday life, I'm, I'm not a perfect hum, human either. Now, an AI system can have the same sense of what is ethical that we do. And you can see ChatGPT already embodies that sense in its own way, even though it's not a moral agent. It has a good ability to answer ethics questions, right? Then, But the AGI doesn't have to have a selfish or a tribal interest unless we program it and, and, and condition it to. It could, come, it could come right out of the box with sort of general common sense of ethics as, it, as its main driver, we just have to configure it that way, right? I mean, we're, we're defining what is the top level goal of the, of the AGI system. We evolved to fight to survive and we have to work to overcome that. Like right, right now, if I'm in a really good mood, I take everything blissfully and calmly. If I'm in a bad mood and someone points out something I did that was wrong or stupid, like, there's some anger that rises up inside me. I'm like, F- you, why are you saying that? And I mean, I, I just d- tamp that down and let that like float past before it takes control of me because I'm 56 years old. I'm not five years old. Right. But, but we all, we all have that. Right. I mean, we evolve with that. You don't have to program that into the, into the AI, right? We, we should not do so. Now we could, if we want to build military robots and if you're building like a corporate sales AI, you may build into it that its motivation is, ha ha, I figured out how to extract all this guy's money by selling him crap he doesn't need. I mean, you could build AIs with that motivation, but we don't have to. We could build an AGI with a motivational system to like do do what the average person would think is the most beneficial, loving, and compassionate thing in this situation. And if we program the AI to have that as its goal, it will do it, and it will probably then evolve a quite sort of enlightened, unattached in, 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 in inner life, which, which is almost natural if you're a mind that's not by design attached to any one body infrastructure or, or, or hunk of, of, of matter, right? So this gets into why I'm optimistic about the potential for beneficial AGI, and why decentralized is important because centralization of control tends mm-hmm. to bring with it some 
narrow motivational system separate from from the the ethics of what's best for everyone. Yeah, fantastic answer, Ben. And I'm aligned with you on all of that. And it's nice to have a guest on the show where we can get uh, into these kinds of topics. You know, I frequently have really brilliant researchers on the show. And I ask them big questions like, you know, where's all this going? And, you know, what would you like to see happen in our lifetimes? Or, you know, what, what kind of world do you want your children or grandchildren to be living in? And it's pretty rare. It's surprisingly rare that people are willing that their that their minds are willing to unfold beyond six months, twelve months, and try to figure out um, how things might look. So this has been a fabulous conversation for me, no doubt, for a lot of our audience as well. Ben, before I let you drop off, I'm sure you'd have an amazing book recommendation for us. Um, let me think. I I, I will uh. I think I'll recommend a book from the late 1960s, actually, which I read when I was a little kid, which is called The the Prometheus Project by a Princeton physicist named Gerald Feinberg. I read this in 75 or so. He wrote it in 68. And what it said is when the next few decades, we're going to get AI smarter than people, the ability to prolong human life indefinitely, and nanotech, the ability to manipulate matter at will, and our choice will be whether to deploy this technology for rampant, useless consumerism or for expansion of human consciousness. And he proposed that the UN should put that to a vote of all global citizens as to whether to take these advancing technologies and, 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 and direct them toward, uh, toward consumerism or toward, toward consciousness expansion. And that it's funny now to look back at how this was was conceived like back in the in the late 1960s because it's it's sort of all there but expressed in an, in an archaic arch, archaic language. Very cool. I love that recommendation. And obviously, uh, anyone can learn a ton from you as they did in today's episode. After this episode, how can they follow you? Yeah, great question. So. Singularitynet.io has links to the various various uh, different uh, media outlets associated with SingularityNet of U- YouTube and Twitter and, and, and blog and, and so forth. For me personally, if you can look at my website, uh, gertzel.org, G-O-E-R-T-Z-E-L.org, or follow me on uh, Twitter or YouTube where I'm just Ben Gertzel. And uh, lots of stuff coming out all the, all the time. Nice. All right, Ben. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And yeah, really uh, mind expanding episode. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Great, great conversation. Whoa, so much to reflect on from today's episode. In it, Ben filled us in on how benevolent decentralized AGI would not have a single owner and be for the benefit of sentient beings. He talked about how neurosymbolic systems, genetic algorithms, and knowledge graphs could be combined with deep learning and potentially realize AGI on a startling three to seven year time span. He talked about how virtual or perhaps even physical interactions between Sophia humanoid robots could also potentially give rise to AGI level intelligence through unstructured exploration. He talked about how the capabilities of AI today are not far from being able to replace in his view four out of five paid jobs that humans do. He talked about how if we realize AGI, the artificial super intelligence and therefore singularity that it could immediately give rise to will dramatically transform society, including by perhaps giving way to an interconnected hive mind and things like femtoscale modelers that could then print any desired object. And he talked about how like a master meditator, an AGI or ASI may be aligned with the best morals of humans and unattached to outcomes. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Dr. Gertzel's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 697. That's superdatascience.com 697. And if you enjoyed this episode, nothing's more valuable to me than if you take a few seconds to rate the show on your favorite podcasting app, or give the video a thumbs up on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. And of course, if you have friends or colleagues that would love the show, let them know. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. 
And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another mind-bending episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we're deeply grateful to our sponsors. Please consider supporting the show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And finally, thanks, of course, to you for listening. I'm so grateful to have you tuning in, and I hope I can continue to make episodes you love for years and years to come. Well, until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.